Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, dear colleagues. Uh, welcome to the 15th Thursday webinar of Professional Voice Society. Uh, we are very excited to be with you tonight, this evening. It's 8 p.m. in Ankara and 7 p.m. in Cairo. We have a very distinguished guest tonight with us. Uh, he's, a, uh, he's a very uh, great friend of mine, but a very respected professor in our society, in the phoniatrics family, uh, both in Europe and also uh, internationally, worldwide. Professor Tamur, Tamer Abu Al-Saad from Mansoura University, Faculty of Medicine. He is a professor of phoniatrics and he is the vice dean for postgraduate studies and research in Mansoura University and he is the board member of Union of European Phoniatricians. And we, are, we have the pleasure uh, to welcome Professor uh, Abu Al-Saad, my dear friend, Professor Tamer, to be with us. Uh, I really, uh, I'm really thankful uh, for uh, having him with us uh, today. And he has a great presentation uh, uh, that I listened uh, actually before. Uh, we will be spending at least one hour together and at the end of the session, you will have the chance to ask your questions to Professor Abu al -Sad. So you can use the question and answer part of the uh, meeting room for sending your questions. I will try to gather them and ask them uh, at the end of the session. So welcome Professor Abu al -Sad. Dear Tamer, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, my dear friend, the Halpun. First, I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me to present this webinar. I met much honored to be with uh, all of you. Uh, my presentation will be about the adult oropharyngeal dysphagia. But first I am from uh, Egypt, from Mansoura. Uh, it's actually, I am uh, uh, two hours north to Cairo. And this is uh, the lowest part of the map. It is the Egypt map and this is the, the upper part is Turkey, so we are close together from Egypt to, to Turkey. And uh, we are close to the Mediterranean Sea, Mansoura city. And this is my city. Uh, this is, we are on the uh, uh, River Nile. It's a beautiful city. And we also we have a beach. We call it Gamasa Beach. Uh, we, uh, this is in the Mediterranean uh, Sea. And uh, this is my faculty. Uh, uh, this is my university campus. The above one is the uh, university campus, Mansoura University campus. And we. this is my faculty during the day and during night, uh, Mansoura Faculty of Medicine. So I'm, I am honored to be with you. And uh, this is the agenda that I will talk today for one hour about uh, the uh, physiological breakdown of oropharyngeal swallowing. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, the incidence and the, the nature of the problem of the patients with oropharyngeal dysphagia, and then in highlighting the causes of oropharyngeal dysphagia in adults, and then how to assess oropharyngeal dysphagia. And then we will talk about the treatment uh, protocols for oropharyngeal dysphagia in adults. And I have many video clips uh, demonstrating some of the problems uh, of these patients. So let's start by the physiological breakdown. Uh, first, we know the swallowing is simply the successful passage of food and drinks from the mouth to the stomach. So this is the normal swallowing. This is the video fluoroscope, what we call it video fluoroscopy. Uh, you know, this is nicely, the, the polus is moving from the mouth to the oral, from the oral cavity to the pharyngeal cavity to the esophagus and to be, uh, to know the uh, the anatomical uh, parts of this uh, video, uh, I, I hope the cursor or the laser pointer is is okay. This is the uh, vallecula. This is the hyoid. This is the airway. This is the vocal fold level, and this is the epiglottis, and this is the arytenoids. So this is the uh, um, lateral view of the uh, oral and the pharyngeal cavities as seen by. Video fluoroscopy. So the swallowing is the successful passage of food and drinks from the mouth to the stomach. And you know, all the normal adult swallowing consists of four phases, oral preparatory phase, oral transport phase, pharyngeal phase, and subjective phase. So any breakdown 
of the physiological and biomechanical neuromotor events of these phases will lead to dysphagia. If we take it in the oral, the breakdown in the oral phase, uh, uh, this is reduced lip closure, for example, will lead to what? Will lead to drooling and poor oral containment. This is one of the physiological breakdown. This is one of the prerequisites for the normal swallow. Good lip closure. So if there is reduced lip closure, will lead to drooling and poor oral containment. Reduce the tone of the buccal and uh, of the facial and buccal musculature will lead to pocketing accumulation of food in the lateral sulcus. Reduce the tongue movement or strength will here the patient cannot increase the lingual pressure to push the thicker food through the mouth to push it back through the oral cavity. Also in the reduced lingopalatal seal, one of the prerequisites uh, that the tongue should touch the palate during the oral phase, but if there is reduced lingopalatal seal, this will do aspiration before the swallow because the airway is still open and the swallowing is not initiated yet. So this will lead to aspiration before the swallow is triggered. Reduced oral sensations, will the patient will cannot feel or localize the food in the mouth, and reduced oral secretions, uh, the saliva is, uh, is reduced or there's stomia. This will prolong the oral transit time. The breakdown could also occur in the pharyngeal phase. For example, delay in triggering or absent the swallow reflex. This will lead to aspiration before the swallow is triggered. Okay, the molus is moving, moving, moving down to the, uh, through the air, through the oropharyngeal tract but there is no triggering or absence of flex, this will lead to aspiration before the swallow is triggered. If there is reduced motion of the tongue pace posteriorly, one of the prerequisites to push the uh, polar through the, through the pharyngeal cavity is the good tongue pace movement. So this will lead to oropharyngeal residue. Reduced vertical or anterior hyoid and the laryngeal motion, the upward and forward movement of the hyoid bone, which is one of the events that happen during swallowing, if, there is, if this event is reduced, this will lead to aspiration during the swallow, okay? And reduced closure of the airway, of course, will lead to aspiration during the swallowing event. Velopharyngeal paresis or paralysis, will lead to nasal rigors of the uh, food or liquids. Unilateral or bilateral pharyngeal wall paresis or paralysis, this will lead to residual food in the vallicule or pyriform fossa. The food will accumulate in these uh, areas and will lead to aspiration after the swallow is finished because from the residue, the residue will be uh, present there and when the patient take his breath, will take will aspirate this materials and this will lead to aspiration after the swallow. And also cricopharyngeal dysfunction, one of the prerequisites of the uh, swallowing is the opening of the upper osteogenesis sphincter. If there is dysfunction in the upper osteogenesis sphincter, what we call it cricopharyngeal dysfunction, will lead to accumulation of food above the uh, upper part uh, uh, on the, uh, in the pyriform fossa, uh, and this will lead to aspiration after the swallow. So we have aspiration could happen before the swallow is triggered, or during the swallowing event, or after the swallowing uh, uh, is uh, finished. So this is the first one of the uh, first part, the physiological breakdowns that happen in the oropharyngeal swallow. So let's talk about the oropharyngeal dysphagia in adults. What is dysphagia? What is the definition of dysphagia? Dysphagia is pain, discomfort, and or difficulty in initiating or completing the act of swallowing. This is a very simple term, and this is describing of the dysphagia in others. Pain, discomfort, or difficulty in initiating or completing the act of swallowing. And the 13 to 14% of patients in acute care hospitals have dysphagia. And the 30 to 50%, uh, 35% of patients in rehabilitation centers have dysphagia. 70 to 90% of elderly patients in nursing home facilities have a swallowing dysfunction even without non-neurological disease. 
80% of stroke patients complain of dysphagia, and 20% of them die from aspiration pneumonia in the first year. And 80 per, uh, uh, 50% of stroke patients have aspiration, and half of them are silent aspirators. So this is some of the figures about the problem or the size of the problem in the uh, oropharyngeal dysphagia in adults. So what is the nature? What will lead to that? What are the complications of oropharyngeal dysphagia? Of course, that will lead to malnutrition, dehydration, aspiration pneumonia, respiratory obstruction like laryngospasm or bronchospasm, reduced quality of life and limited socialization because we, we love to, to, to dine together and this will lead to limited socialization and of course, limitation of work and achievement. Okay, so this is uh, the first uh, part. So let's talk about the causes of oropharyngeal dysphagia in adults. Any cause in medicine, any cause of medicine can lead to dysphagia. It could be neurologic, neuromuscular or muscular causes, like central causes, for example, stroke syndromes, Parkinson's disease, amateur of lateral sclerosis, or multiple sclerosis or dementia, or preferred causes, uh, preferred nerve problems of the larynx, pharynx, or tongue, jaw, neuromuscular function disorders like mycenia gravis, or muscular problems like myopesis. Also, it could be head and neck anatomic abnormalities, for example, disconfigurations after surgical and radiotherapeutic management of head and neck cancer, or trauma to the oropharyngeal laryngeal tract, whether it is accidental, for example, close or acoustic ingestion or fairness to that area, or iatrogenic that did by us, for example, tracheostomy. Uh, and tracheostomy can lead to dysphagia that it will decrease the superior and anterior displacement of the larynx, and this will diminish the upper osteoviscular sphincter opening and can lead to pharyngeal residue, and this will lead to aspiration. Also decrease the laryngeal closure, one of the mechanisms of dysphagia and tracheostomy, decrease laryngeal closure, and it could lead to also osteoviscular obstruction by the inflated cup of the tracheal tube. These are the uh, mechanism of tracheostomy that can lead to dysphagia and others. Also congenital defects, for example, tracheosteogel fistula or the Zenger diverticulum, vascular anomalies, cervical spine osteophytes. Uh, this is one of the uh, uh, common things in uh, osteoarthritis, especially if the osteophyte is large and add the cervical three, three and clue that. This can lead to uh, clicopharyngeal dysfunction and can lead to mechanical also dysphagia. Infections, uh, infections local or systemic infections, hand and neck tumors and malignancy can lead to uh, uh, other dysphagia. Also systemic problems like thyroid disease, hyperthyroidism, hypo and hyperthyroidism can lead to goiter and this will lead to mechanical dysphagia. Iron and the B12 deficiency lead to corticopulbar dysfunction and this will lead to dryness of the mucous membrane and tongue pairs, and this will lead to painful swallowing. Also, Jogren's syndrome, xerostomia, and this will prolong the oral transport phase. Amyloidosis, uh, this is, uh, will be a uh, deposition of the amyloid material in the tongue, for example, and this will lead to stiffness of the tongue and may obstruct the pharynx. Pesce syndrome that lead to aphthous ulcers of the oral mucosa and esophagus, and this will lead to, of course, painful swallowing. Uh, also, many drugs, many drugs have a side effects. Uh, and actually, I, I have a chapter, uh, this will, uh, will be presented in the phoniatric book that will, uh, I think, in next April, I have a chapter on the pharmacolog pharmacological side effects of the drugs on the dysphagia. And also, lastly, could be psychogenic one. Psychogenic, so no, no problems at all but it could be a part of the psychogenic problem of the patients. So these are the causes uh, of the uh, oropharyngeal dysphagia. As I said, it could be any cause in medicine. Are you okay if, up till this point? If this any, any things, everything is evident? If th everything is clear or not? Everything is very clear, Tanash. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So let's go to the main bulk of the uh, of my presentation, the assessment and management of oropharyngeal dysphagia. Let's start by the assessment, how to assess a patient with oropharyngeal dysphagia in adults. Uh, we have these three uh, um, levels of assessment. First, 
the bedside assessment or elementary diagnostic procedures. And then we have clinical diagnostic aids. And lastly, additional instrumental measures when we need it, according to the case. So we have these three levels of assessing the oropharyngeal dysphagia. First, the elementary diagnostic procedures, let us uh, start uh, from the start by the resident uh, uh, history taking patient's interview. The patient with the oropharyngeal dysphagia could be presented with either with the symptom or with the complication. What are the symptoms of the patient uh, that presented with oropharyngeal dysphagia? It could be problems, can be presented with problems with chewing, could be presented with difficulty initiating swallowing, could be presented with nasal regurgitation or drooling, or can present with difficulty managing secretions, could be presented with coughing or shocking episodes during eating, or he could complain of food sticking in the throat. Or the patient could be presented by a complication like dehydration, malnutrition, laryngospasm, bronchospasm, or aspiration pneumonia. So these are the presentation of the patient uh, with oropharyngeal dysphagia. Uh, on the other side, also vaginal dysphagia is another, the patient is presented with other things, chest discomfort, food sticking in the chest, could complain of regurgitation, heart fair, or symptoms more pharyngeal or laryngeal in nature. So this is differentiation between a patient with oropharyngeal dysphagia or patient with oesophageal dysphagia. As a phoniatrician, we are dealing with the patients with oropharyngeal dysphagia. Oesophageal dysphagia is dealt with the gastroenterologist or maybe ENT doctors or something like that, okay? And then we analyze the complaint of the patient, uh, the onset, the course, and duration, because this will help us how to, to locate the, the cause of, or, the, uh, or the etiology. And then we take some details about the swallowing and the nutritional status. Some of these uh, uh, questions like, what is the type of difficulty? What is the type of difficult food? Is there any coughing or choking episodes during eating? Many questions uh, asking about that in the uh, swallowing and duration status. And then we ask about uh, respiratory symptoms. Is there any frequent chest infections and coughing? Then we ask about neurological symptoms, any symptoms suggestive of cranial nerve affection, and the most important cranial nerves that we are searching for, the fifth, seventh, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth cranial nerves. These are related to the swallowing. Of course, we ask about the symptoms should suggest of motor and sensory affection and involuntary movements, because all of these things affect the mechanics of the swallowing. And then we, we, we uh, uh, also uh, ask about the cognitive and the communicative abilities of the patient. If the patient oriented to time, place, and persons can follow directions, and what is the method of communication now? This is very important. I will talk about that during the screening because this will, uh, will take our decision about uh, uh, whether to feed the patient or not. Okay? Uh, and then hearing and vision of the patient, any previous investigations, any previous signs of management of these patients, and we talk, uh, ask about the past history of the patient, diabetic, hypertensive, if there are any transit, ischemic attacks, heart problems, trauma, radiation, surgery, or any drug intake. These will help us to know the cause or the problem or direct us to the uh, management of these patients. And then we proceed to the examination of the patient, general examination, if the patient's alert, reactive, and can able to follow directions, and also we observe for signs of malnutrition, dehydration, and aspiration pneumonia. And then we do preliminary visualization of the oropharyngolaryngeal tract. This is very important because if we see accumulation of oropharyngeal secretions within the laryngeal vestibule is highly predictive of aspiration of food and liquid later in the examination. This is very important to take that uh, very more tip for that because if you see many secretions in the accumulating in the valiculi or the pyriform fossae, this is uh, an indication that there is a problem in the prostalsis or in the swallowing of these patients and uh, is highly predictive of aspiration of food and liquids later in the examination. And then we do neck examination, of course, and neurological examination. Uh, then we can do uh, observations during trial feeding. If it is safe, so we can do easy material in a small amounts. And from that, we can take some informations, like the way the patient swallows during meals, 
the swallow initial time, which is normally one to two seconds, the range and timing of elevation of the hyoid bone and the cricoid cartilage, and the phonation after each trial, I'm asking the patient to phonate if I give him some uh, water, for example, and he say, ah, if it is clear, it's indicative that it is there is no uh, penetration or aspiration, but if it is gargling voice, it indicates that there is uh, a penetration or aspiration. We can look at drooling, oral containment, food accumulation in the buccal or labio alveolar cavities, and if there is coughing or choking episode, whether it is immediate, which it could uh, uh, have uh, the aspiration, could mean that it, it's aspiration before or during the swallowing, or it is late, which can be indicative of aspiration after the swallow. So these are some of uh, observation during trial feeding, and I will talk about that, the screening, how to do screening uh, in the assessment just in two minutes or a few minutes. And then if the patient is at hospital, we can observe him during meal time, his position, how he can deal with the the uh, with the meal and how he, he if he has need assistance or not. Many uh, uh, items we can take from observation during meal time. But is what is the value of the bedside assessment? What what we can get from the bedside assessment? It is a good indicator of the oral function. It is a good indicator of the cognitive and the language abilities of the patient. It is a good indicator of the behavioral control needed for eating. For example, ability to judge how much and how fast the food should be placed in the mouth. And also it is a good indicator of the ability to remember and follow directions. But it have a problem. It is unreliable in defining the pharyngeal motor control because the clinician's limited ability to visualize the pharynx without a radiographic technique. So this is the, uh, 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 the advantage and the pros and cons of the bedside assessment. So this leads us to the second level of the assessment of the oropharyngeal dysphagia, the clinical diagnostic aids. We have two gold, uh, gold standards for assessment of the oropharyngeal dysphagia. We have video fluoroscopy, another name modified barium swallow, or sometimes cuckoo swallow. And the other uh, tool is the fiber optic endoscopic examination of swallowing or fees. And we have sometimes ultrasonography. Of course, we have some, we should do some testing of the language, speech, and going to If, for example, patients with aphasia, we can do aphasia test. Or patients with mental retardation, we can do cognitive and perceptual analysis, something, or dementia, we can do some tests for that. Let's talk about the two gold standards for assessment of oropharyngeal dysphagia video fluoroscopy, and the fiber optic endoscopic examination of swallowing. Video, fluoros video fluoroscopy or modified barium swallow. Uh, it enables us in visualization of the oral stage of swallowing, triggering of the pharyngeal swallow in relation to the position of the polus, can visualize all motor aspects of the pharyngeal swallow in both lateral and anterior views, but it have a problem. It doesn't enable measurement of the pressures generated during the swallow if we are interested in this parameter. Okay, this can be measured by uh, manometry. I will talk about that. So the, this is the video fluoroscopy. So the modified barium swallow assesses the oropharyngeal swallow. We can use calibrated policies from one cc to 10 cc. We can use variety of policy consistencies, whether we can use thin liquid, thick liquid, semi-solid and solid consistency. And we examine the patient in upright position, and we can evaluate the therapy procedures on site by using modified barium swallow. So, what is the study? How we can perform this study? Uh, if you have a, a, an X ray department in your uh, hospital, we can do that modified barium swallow study. So we should need we have equipment. We uh, what are the contrastist material used? what are the technique of the modified barium swallow and how we can analyze the video fluoroscopic image. First, for the equipment, we need a fluoroscopy machine, which is actually in every hospital, fluoroscopy machine, which includes three major parts. Any fluoroscopy machine have three major parts, table, in which the patient lies or leans, fluoroscopy tube, which represents the X-ray, okay, and monitor, on which the radiographic picture is viewed. So these three 
parts are, are the major parts of the fluoroscopy machine, which is present in every uh, hospital table, fluoroscopy tube, and the monitor. And then we can connect the monitor to a video cassette recorder or laptop with the DV tuner, which is very easy, and the microphone so for real time voice recording of the examiner and the patient. This is very uh, 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 straightforward uh, connections. So we can record the modified barium swallow or video, video fluoroscopic assessment. We know that in the uh, uh, during the uh, routine X-ray, it's it, it is a flat, it is a, a term, it is a film that is a spot film. But in the video fluoroscope, we needed a dynamic uh, examination of the uh, of the swallowing. And then, what are the contrast test material we use? We have liquid consistency semi-solid consistency and solid consistency. It's very easy, we can prepare the liquid consistency. We have thin liquid and thick liquid. You can prepare thin liquid by um, one part of barium plus four parts of water or one part of barium plus one part of water to produce a thick liquid. And we can have amounts of three, five, 10 or cup drinking. Actually during the clinical routine, we use it five milliliter. But we have suspecting aspiration, we can uh, um, um, uh, use the lower uh, volumes, like three millimeters or one milliliters. And the method of administration, we can use a spoon or syringe or straw. Uh, for the semi-solid consistency, we can prepare it by putting one spoon of, uh, of uh, powder parium plus a cup of pudding and uh, stir it so it will be uh, 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 very clear for during the uh, videofluoroscopic uh, assessment. And we give it to the patient by five milliliter. And solid consistency, it's one fourth of a cup coated with the parian pudding uh, to be uh, uh, clear during the videofluoroscopic assessment. And if the patient complains for food specific dysphagia, sometimes the patients say, I have a, a problems with the meat, I have a problems with the rice, for example. So we can mix it with the parian and examine uh, under the X-ray uh, machine. So this is the contrast test material. We can prepare it very easily at the hospital uh, with a liquid consistency, thin, lake thick, and semi-solids and solid consistency. And what is the technique? How I, uh, I uh, deal with the patient? First, the technique positioning of the patient. Uh, we have two positions for the patients, the lateral view, like in this uh, image, or the anthropocene view. And in the lateral view, the patient is positioned upright, like this lady. Uh, actually, she is uh, uh, my, uh, my student. <laughs> uh, so this is the patient is positioned upright, and the uh, fluoroscope tube is focused so that the following structures are in view the lips anteriorly. So this circle should include the lips anteriorly, the soft palate superiorly the posterior pharyngeal wall posteriorly and the pharyngeal segment at the level of the cervical pipe and sac uh, inferiorly. So in this circle, these uh, uh, structures should be in view so that in this way, the oral pharyngeal and the upper part of the esophagus can be assessed, okay? So this is the lateral view and positioning of the patient in the lateral view so that these structures are in view together at the same time. While in the anteroposterior view, it's used for some uh, parameters, if I'm interested in that, uh, to assess the symmetry of the bolus movement, to assess uh, the stasis in the valliculi and the biform uh, sinuses, and the vocal fold movement. So in this, view, I can assess these parameters, the symmetry of the bolus, because uh, you know that the bolus is split at the level of the vallicula and then reunite again at the level of the pyroform sinus. So if there is symmetry in the movement of the bolus, uh, this is okay. But if there is asymmetry, it could be indicate a paralysis of one side uh, in the uh, uh, pharyngeal uh, cavity. Uh, stasis in the vallicula and the pyroform sinus, which mean residue, or uh, also we can judge the vocal fold movement and height during that anteroposterior view. So uh, how we, uh, the second method of administration of the contrast material for liquids and the semi-solid consistency, the patient is asked to hold the polis in his or her mouth 
and then swallow uh, the whole wall, the whole bolus once only. So swallow it once only, okay? And for solid consistency, the patient is asked to chew, and the patient is doing now, uh, the cookie, and then swallow once ready. So this is the video fluoroscopic, so I can assess. This is moving nicely. This is normal swallow. There is nothing uh, abnormal in that. So let's go to show some examples of radiological signs reflecting aspects of oropharyngeal dysphagia. This is the normal swallow. Uh, uh, the polus is in black. This is in a video fluoroscopy. In the spot film, it is in white, but in video fluoroscopy, it's black. Uh, it's moving nicely from the oral cavity to the pharyngeal cavity to the upper part of the esophagus. There is no penetration or aspiration. Anything moving one second in the oral cavity, another one second in the pharyngeal cavity, and go to the esophagus uh, nicely without anything. So this is the normal swallowing in video fluoroscopic image. Uh, let's go with this problem, rocking movement of the tongue with difficulty in shedding swallow. Look at that. The patient is uh, pushing back the polus, pushing back. The polus is moving up uh, forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards. Then the patient succeeded eventually to push it back. This is characteristic of the Parkinson's disease, characteristic of that. The rocking movement uh, of the tongue with difficulty in shedding the swallowing. Uh, look at it, they is trying, sometimes they succeed, but not, and then eventually the, uh, uh, and there's also residue here, as you see here in the valliculate. Uh, here, delayed pharyngeal response, uh, which means, what's meant by delayed pharyngeal response? It means that the bolus passed the ramus of the mandible, but the pharyngeal swallow reflex is not triggered. The bolus should add the ramus of the mandible triggering the pharyngeal swallow. You could see here the patient, yeah, it's it passing the ramus of the mandible, actually it goes down to the valliculate and the bioprocess and then trigger the swallow. This is delayed pharyngeal response. Okay. Uh, it, uh, another problem is difficult in shedding the swallow with delayed pharyngeal response. Look at that case. Is trying to push the polus. Actually, the polus come to the down to the valicula and the bioform sinus. The patient's trying to push it hardly, pushing hardly, and then eventually succeeded in uh, uh, triggering the swallow. So we have difficulty in shading and swallow and with the delayed pharyngeal response because the bolus passed the ramus of the mandible without initiating the swallow. Uh, another uh, case with the difficulty in initiating the swallow with delayed pharyngeal response. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, an example of the patient with stroke, actually, stroke patients. Uh, uh, so the patient is trying. Yeah, there is a, a polis pass to the ramus of the mandible, as you could see here. And the patient still, yeah, succeeds eventually to uh, swallow uh, this uh, uh, polis. Oropharyngeal residue. This is an example of oral pharyngeal residue. The, after the patient finished the swallow, we can, you could see that there's a lot of residue here in the valliculi, in the bioform sinuses, in the base of the tongue, in the posterior pharyngeal wall. So this is uh, 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 a swallowing problem, oral pharyngeal residue. And he can, is susceptible to have a sw uh, aspiration after the swallow. So this is oral pharyngeal residue example. This is a, 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 a another view. This anteroposterior view, uh, material residue in the valliculi and the bioform sinuses. You could see here the patient is uh, after the swallow. There is residue here in the valliculi and the bioform sinuses, as the arrows uh, uh, refer to in the valliculi and the bioform sinuses. And then we have two large problems. First is the laryngeal penetration. What's meant by laryngeal penetration? Laryngeal penetration means food or liquid entering the airway entrance, but it's still above or at the vocal fold level. So this is meant by laryngeal penetration. Uh, this is an example of the laryngeal penetration. Look at the polus, the, the black one. It entered the, yes, yes, now it entered the airway and then ejected, but it is not below the vocal fold. A level. So this is the penetration before 
the swallow. And this penetration during the swallow, look at this patient uh, at the uh, airway. Yes, this is during the swallow. You know, this is a, a, as a finger uh, inside the airway, but it is not below the level of the uh, vocal folds. We call it penetration during the swallowing event. And this is penetration before the swallow is initiated. Yeah, ejected, ejected, and then now the patient swallow. So this is the definition of the range of penetration. And then we have tracheal aspiration. What's meant by tracheal aspiration? It means that food or liquid entering the airway to the level of the trachea, below the level of the vocal folds. We have two examples of aspiration during swallowing. Like this is the first one. Yes, did you see that? A patient's coughing now. Uh, the the uh, the polis is some of the polis went to the esophagus, but uh, ten or twenty percent go to the airway. As you see here, this is the airway. Another one. Did you see that? This is yeah, the black one going in the airway. So this is aspiration uh, during the uh, swallowing. Also, we have what is known as cricopharyngeal dysfunction, which means that inadequate opening of the upper esophageal sphincter during the swallowing. You could see here the patient is trying to uh, push down the polus, but the polus is, uh, is above the upper esophageal sphincter. Sometimes he succeeds to push something, but uh, others go to the airway. And this is characteristic of the brainstem stroke, actually. Cricopharyngeal dysfunction. Brainstem stroke uh, is characterized by cricopharyngeal dysfunction. So uh, you, you could see here the patient uh, have cricopharyngeal dysfunction, and the, uh, the polis is sometimes go to the esophagus, sometimes go to the uh, airway. Lastly, there is also a nasal nasal regurgitation of barium liquid. The patient is uh, swallowing, but there is nasal regurgitation. So this is the velum, and some of the polis enter through the um, the nose through so nasal regurgitation. So after we finish this uh, study, we have a checklist. This is the checklist that we use in Mansour University Modified Barium Swallow Evaluation Checklist. We have the this box have the different demographic data of the patient. And then in this um, row, the different food consistencies in different volumes. And this in this uh, column, the different events that happen in the different stages of swallowing, the oral preparatory, oral transport, and the pharyngeal stage. And then we rate this if it is present or not. And the degree of impairment, we have here the key for uh, our evaluations. And we also, we use the eight point penetration aspiration scale, what is, which is proposed by Rosenbeck et al. in 1996. We use the eight point scale that proposed. And this is the second page of the checklist, uh, the rest of the, uh, 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 the events that happen in the pharyngeal stage. And if we are interested in some research, for example, the temporal measures of the swallowing, like the oral transit time, the oral clearance duration, the stage transition duration. I have actually a lecture about that. We can, uh, we can uh, discuss it that in another lecture about how to measure these transit times uh, if you're interested in the research in the swallowing. And then we have also this box, the anthroposterior view. And if there is any trial therapy and our comments and lastly, the recommendations for the patient. So this is the checklist that we use it in Mansour University for Neatric. So what is the cost effectiveness of video fluoroscopy? What is the data we can get from that? It detects the abnormalities in the patient's anatomy and or swallowing physiology. It assesses the transit times, speed, and efficiency of polis movement. The modified barium solu has been shown to be more accurate than the bedside examinations and identifying whether the aspiration is occurring and an identifying cause of aspiration. The modified barium can prevent unneeded or trial and error treatments and can provide immediate and clinically useful information. And it defines optimum eating strategies to enable the patient to continue at least partial oral intake. And also it 
is used for education of the healthcare professional, patients, and their families regarding the nature of the patients who have problems which may not be visible at the patient's bedside. And also it increases the family and patient's compliance if we are recommending non-oral feeding or other swallowing instructions. Since the, one of the gold standard of the proscope, but another gold standard is the fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. Here in the fees, we use food coloring added to the polis, which permits evaluation of residual pooling and aspiration. Uh, this is uh, uh, the video, the uh, fiber optic endoscopic evaluation. It is used to examine the anatomy of the oral and the pharynx, examine the pharynx and larynx before and after the swallow. It assesses the, the ability of the patient to use airway closure maneuver, for example, the supraglottic swallow and super supraglottic swallow before the actual swallow. But it have a problem. The fees does not enable to visualize the swallowing itself because it, there is a white out, as you see, a white out during the swallowing. Uh, and also it may interfere with swallowing in some patients. So this is the fiber optic and scopic evaluation of swallowing. Uh, there is an, uh, 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 also uh, some um, testing, which is fiber optic scopic evaluation solving with sensory testing. It is not routinely used, but it is, uh, uh, it is uh, present. I've uh, said it about that. It is used to assess the sensory capacity of the laryngopharynx, what we call it laryngeal adductor reflex. Uh, 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 the reflex is that we use calibrated buff of air, 2 to 10 milliliter mercury in 50 seconds, is delivered to the aryabiglottic region, like in this video. And the resulting response is brief closure of the vocal folds with or without the swallowing. So if the elastic uh, uh, laryngeal adductor reflex is below four millimeter mercury, this is a normal response. If it is between four to six millimeter mercury, this is a mo there is moderate laryngopharyngeal sensory deficit, but if this, we need more than six millimeter mercury to elicit the response, there will be severe laryngopharyngeal sensor deficit. Uh, actually, we can uh, test that by touching the aryabiglottic fold so we can have a laryngeal adductor reflex without using this uh, uh, calibrated buff of air. Another uh, uh, thing that we use it in FUIS is the ice ships protocol, which is proposed by Langmore, Susan Langmore. The ice ships are likely to be less likely to be aspirated than the actual liquid or solid force. The representation of ice ships as a preliminary trial during fees for patients who are deemed at high risk of aspiration have been recommended to indicate their potential to, to tolerate more challenging polar safety. So we use these ice ships to see if the patients can tolerate these ice ships or not because they are less likely to be aspirated, okay? So the patients who aspirate on the content of the ice ships at the beginning of the fees were likely to demonstrate aspiration on the actual liquid polis during the fees, and then we recommend NBO, nothing per mouse. But if the patients who don't aspirate the content of the ice ships were less likely to demonstrate aspiration during the fees and are more likely to be advanced to the oral diet, and in this case, we can challenge the patient more, we can give some of challenging food to uh, challenge the, uh, the uh, oral pharyngeal tract to, to be more aggressive during the fees examination. So we, in this ice ships protocol, we, uh, the first part of it, emphasize the anatomy, secretions, laryngeal competence, sensation, and denote spontaneous swallow and acute swallow. And then I give the patients one third, one half of these spoonful dyed green ice ships, and then observe effect of that on swallowing and the effect on the secretions and the presence of cough if aspirated. So this is uh, the ice ships protocol, which is proposed by Susan Langmore, which is actually very helpful in uh, deciding how to proceed in the examination and in the management. This is some of the uh, examples of fees, pharyngeal residue. The patient is uh, taking, uh, uh, now you can see there is after the swallow, there's residue here in the valiculia and sometimes, uh, uh, sometime in the uh, piriform sinuses. Okay, this is pharyngeal uh, residue. Okay, let's go uh, because of the time. And this is uh, examples of penetration during the swallow. Penetration, as I said, anything uh, uh, enter the airway, but still above the level of the vocal folds. Okay, so this is uh, 
penetration during the swallow. You could see here there is gray, uh, green, uh, green uh, uh, poluses in the airway. Also here there is a green polus in the airway above the level of the vocal folds and the uh, epiglottis from uh, at the laryngeal uh, side. For the aspiration, which means, as I said, food or liquid entering the airway below the level of the uh, vocal folds. So you could see here there is a, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, food uh, in the below the level of the vocal folds. Here is milk here actually in the middle. Uh, there is a milk yes below the level of the vocal fold. And also here, there is some yogurt here, which is also uh, below the level of the vocal folds. So this is an example of keys that we use it to detect uh, residue, penetration, or aspiration. Actually, uh, fees is more accurate than videoscopy in detecting the residue. Uh, the, one of the... Uh, uh, tools that we can use also in oropharyngeal dysphagia, the ultrasonography. It can use the tool, if we're interested in the oral uh, uh, stage, it can be used to observe the oral tongue function and to measure oral transit times and also motion of the hyoid bone. And you can use it also during uh, pediatric feeding and swallowing if you are uh, uh, interested by the press feeding. So we can use that. But the problem of ultrasonography, it cannot visualize the pharynx because of the mix of the tissue types cartilage bone and the muscles in the pharynx. So it's difficult to interpret the uh, findings when, when you are using the ultrasonography. So the best for use of ultrasonography is during the oral stage. We have additional instrumental measures that we can, if you're interested, manometry. The manometry, if you're interested in pressure measurements, we can combine the uh, manometry with the radiography, uh, especially indicated if I'm interested in difficulty opening the upper esophageal sphincter. And we also electromyography may help in identifying the medical diagnosis of patients with dysphagia. Uh, uh, we can use it also for, for biofeedback, uh, for uh, muscle during the swallowing, or the biofeedback during we use it for Mandelson. So this is the uh, the case uh, uh, because of the time now. Uh, let's go. Uh, I will talk about something about the screening. Uh, in screening, we, as I said, the, there is two um, uh, gold standards, the fiber optoscopic evaluation of swallowing video and the video fluoroscopy. But sometimes many clinicians work in a setting, there is no easy access to an instrumental swallow and evaluation. So they need some sort of screening so they can use it. So before they can refer that to the, the patients to do uh, video fluoroscopy or, or the fiber optoscopic evaluation of swallowing. Uh, so uh, let's go wide screen. Gold standard for the version is the video fluoroscopy or modified barium swallow. No feasible or ob to objectively evaluate every patient and risk. Uh, also for the staffing and the work with needs, uh, ac uh, uh, the access to the patients for nutrition, speech, language pathologists is mostly a referral based surface. And the screening is important in identifying patients at risk for aspiration. Um, Lider et al. have found that. Silent aspiration is a common problem in the stroke patients. Uh, uh, they, uh, 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 the little that demonstrated that a uh, novel evidence said silent aspiration is a volume dependent. So patients thought to be silent aspirators of small volumes uh, uh, demonstrated over the symptoms and signed with higher volumes. Uh, so this will support the screening with higher volumes. So. He uh, proposed the three ounce water swallow test. It is sensitive, which means that accurately identified patients with aspiration risk, 96%, and the specific 48%, which means that overrate refers to the objective testings. So patients pass this test can be recommended an oral diet. So how do we do that? The patient is asked to sit upright, ask him to drink 90 milliliter of water continuously without stopping, and assist the patients for coughing or choking or throat clearing during swallowing and immediately after drink. The patient pass, if he is able to drink that volume sequentially without overt symptoms and signs of aspiration, and he fail if he is unable to drink the entire amount sequentially 
or demonstrate coughing or choking during trial. Actually, in Mansour and Abbas, we are using the Yale swallow protocol, which consists of three parts, the three water, the three ounce water swallow test, plus brief cognitive screening, just the three uh, questions asking the patient, what's your name? Where are you right now? What years is it now? And or mechanism examination, ask the patient to do lip closure, lingual range of motion, and facial symmetry by asking them to smile or pocketing their lips. Why that? They found that patient disoriented have a cognitive problem. The odds of liquid aspiration is where 31% greater than if oriented. And for patients who are unable to follow one-step commands, the odds of liquid aspiration or pure aspiration or being deemed null was 57 to 48 to 69 percent greater than patients who are able to do so. So this is a very good uh, uh, um, uh, uh, screening test that can lead us when the patient uh, can proceed to oral feeding or not. So best practice for a swallowing screen is the use of validated screen like the Yale School Protocol. Passing of such screen allows the patients to be placed on diet while failure of this screen requires the patient to be evaluated for, by an instrumental assessment. So let's talk uh, lastly about the management or treatment of oropharyngeal dysphagia in adults. What is the, the aim of the treatment of such patients? Is to eliminate aspiration or improve the inefficient swallow, which means residue remaining in the mouth or pharynx after the swallow. We have modalities for such a treatment. Behavioral adjustment therapy, as a phonetrician or speech language pathologist, we use that. Uh, uh, another modality that's not our specialty, but we can refer it for introduction of intraoral prosthetics or surgical intervention. If we failed, we can use alternate routes of alimentation. So, what is the behavioral adjustment therapy or PRAT? The aim of that is redirect or improve the flow of food and eliminate the patient's symptoms, for example, aspiration. So, we have many PRAT techniques many behavioral adjustment therapy techniques for dysphagia. We have postural techniques, we have modification of the manner of feeding, we have oral sensor enhancement techniques for swallowing, we have exercises to the muscles involved in the swallowing, we have swallowing maneuvers and the modification of the food variables. Like these are of some of the postural techniques, the chin down, which you can narrow the airway entrance during swallow, head rotated to the damaged site, which eliminates the damaged side of the pharynx from the polar pass or directs the polar down the stronger side, the chin down and head rotated to the damaged side with the rationale that it narrows the laryngeal entrance, the head tilt to the stronger side with the rationale it directs the polis down to the stronger side by gravity, head forwards, decreases the resting pressure in the upper osmosis sphincter, while head back uses gravity to clear the oral cavity. So this is an example of the patient uh, aspiration during the swallow. As you see here, he is aspirating, there's swallowing, but when the patient, the same patient, did the chin down, you could see is, yeah, there is nothing go to the airway, okay? Uh, this is the chin down alone didn't help the patient. Uh, there is a, a aspiration during uh, the this, this swallowing with the chin down alone, but the patient, when he did a chin down and the head rotated to the demo side, nothing go to the wrong way. Here is, yeah, it goes in the wrong way, but when he used two models together, chin down and head rotated to the damaged side, it helped the patient. Patient with total glossocotomy, he did uh, a head back. This is uh, uh, helped the patient to swallow the head back with the patient with total glossectomy, which means the removal of the whole tongue, and he could manage that. So the posture techniques works well with the neurologically impaired swallow patients with head and neck cancer resections or other structural damage, all ages patients, but it have limitations. Patients with cognitive disorders cannot follow the directions and patients with head stabilization devices or other physical constraints cannot use the postural techniques. We have another modality modification of the manner of feeding. We found that smaller policies at a slower rate may eliminate any risk of aspiration, also, presentation of food follows to the back of the mouth uh, could bypass the oral transport stage. And also, when we ask the patient to do multiple swallows, will improve the residue clearance from the oral pharynx. The third uh, prior technique is augmentation of the sensory input before or during the swallow. We call sensory enhancement techniques. The aim or the idea is to stimulate the onset of the swallow, reflex 
prior to or during the initiation of the patient swallow attempts. So it's indicated in delayed triggering of the pharyngeal swallow or also reduced the high laryngeal elevation. So we have many uh, sensor enhancement techniques like increase the downward pressure of the spoon on the tongue during the swallowing, or we can use sour polis. For example, we can use lemon juice or the cold polis, it stimulates the swallow, or large volume polis, we can use it if it's safe, or polis require chewing itself, it's a facilitated swallowing, uh, allow self-feeding itself, allow uh, it will facilitate swallowing, and also exaggerated suck swallow for the fluids, it will help to draw back the saliva if there is drooling. Thermotactile stimulation is one of the uh, methods of sensor enhancement techniques. We use rubbing vertically and firmly on the anterior pressure pillars by ice cold mirrors, the zero zero size, four to, four, four to five times prior to swallowing attempt on a saliva or a small polis. This is will stimulate the swallowing. This is an example of uh, thermal stimulation uh, facilitate the initial swallowing. This is stroke patients, uh, and we did uh, 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 thermal stimulation of the, uh, the anterior to cellular pillars, and then I give the bolus directly after that, immediately after that. This will stimulate the swallow for patient We have delayed pharyngeal uh, response or delayed pharyngeal swallow. Okay, as you see, I'm I'm rubbing now, and then the patient immediately I give him the food bolus food, and then, yeah, it's succeed and swallowing immediately, yes. Uh, the eye chips uh, also uh, is one, of, uh, it's used for evaluation and used also for management. It's a therapeutic technique with the tolerance of eye chips being used to identify patients' candidacy for dysphagia rehabilitation, and it has been uh, be safe for NPO patients or people who have difficulties managing this, their secretions due to risk of aspiration. So, very small eye shapes presentations are more likely to melt slowly and fill the protective cavities without overflow, given the slow or co un uncoordinated patients time to generate the pharyngeal swallow. So it wake up, wake up the system and generates subcutaneous swallow. So its eye shapes can be used uh, for the uh, management or sensor enhancement techniques. Also surface electric stimulation, it can be used uh, synchronous contraction of the thyro um, thyrohyoid muscles by synchronous electric stimulation through surface electrodes placed on the neck. This will indicate for reduced hyolaryngeal elevation due to a stroke. Also, the muscles exercised to the muscles involved in swallowing. It could be used for patients with head and neck radiation. It could be started weeks before radiotherapy, and they may last for six months after the compilation of radiotherapy. This will help with the prevent the muscle atrophy, uh, like range of motion exercises, polis control shaving exercises, hung holding maneuvers uh, exercises, uh, head lifting exercises by Shakir exercises like that. You ask the patient to do three repetitive one minute sustained head raisings in the supine position. He will be uh, able to observe the toes without raising the shoulders of the ground and then interrupted by one minute rest period then followed by 30 consecutive repetitions of head raisings in the same subbind position. This exercise is carried out three times per day for six weeks. That will strengthen the suprahyoid and infrahyoid muscles involved in laryngeal elevation US opening. And this will increase the anteroposterior diameter of the US opening. And this is best for the cricopharyngeal uh, dysfunction. So also we have swallow maneuvers, which is the change of the swallow physiology. May I have uh, uh, 10 minutes more, uh, Haldun, please? 10 minutes, not more. Sure, because that's that's a great course for everybody. Thank you. <laughs> yes, okay. sure, sure. Right. You can use any any time you like, Tamer. Thank okay, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the swallowing maneuvers, uh, it is designed to change the swallow physiology. Uh, it is not suitable for patients with cognitive or, uh, or significant language permit or patients who fatigue easily. So uh, uh, here we are changing the swallow physiology. Uh, we have uh, uh, some maneuvers like the sobraglottic swallow or super sobraglottic swallow or effortful swallow or mandus maneuver. For the sobraglottic swallow, we ask the patient to take deep breath, swallow while holding breath, then cough and swallow again. This procedure will voluntarily uh, close the airway at the level of the true vocal folds before and during the swallow. This will protect the airway during swallow, supraglottic swallow. So it is used in delayed pharyngeal swallow and late vocal fold closures. 
we can use what's called super supraglottic swallow. I'm asking the patient to do a vertebral breath holding, swallow, cough out before taking breath, and swallow again. Hey, then I swallow, cough, and and swallow again. So a first full breath hold will tilt the arytenoid forward, closing the airway entrance before and during the swallow, elevates the larynx earlier than normal, and increases the subglottic pressure. So it is used in reduced closure of the airway uh, entrance. This is an example of the patient's epiglottectomy with uh, aspiration. You could see the patient that uh, there is aspiration below the level of the vocal folds. When the same patient did what supraglot swallow, what means he is holding his breath before the swallow and the swallow uh, and then uh, cough. So this will, yeah, there is nothing go to the wrong airway. Also, this is a patient with multi-infarction and the pseudopalpar palsy. He has aspiration and uh, this is actually a female uh, with multi-infarcted. Multi uh, uh, then aspirate, yes, aspirate now, but when I did Two things, thermal stimulation, uh, as you see here, uh, the, uh, and the supraglottic swallow, the patient uh, safely uh, uh, swallow the colos. Yes. We have also a portable swallow. Just ask the, the patient to swallow hard. The effort itself will increase the posterior motion of the tongue phase during the pharyngeal swallow improve the bolus clearance from the balicule and increases the intrapharyngeal pressure. So it is best used for patients with reduced posterior movement of the tongue phase. And this is an example of the patients with total laryngectomy. We have uh, patients with thick liquid residue and the semi-solid uh, residue. And just ask the patient to hard multiple swallow, hard swallow with multiple swallows. This will clear the residue as you see here. And also this patient, with the heart multiple swallow with total laryngectomy, um, uh, cleared the, the uh, residue nicely. Also, this is a patient with left hemiglycectomy plus total laryngopharyngectomy. Uh, this is a female patient. Uh, and when I uh, asked her to do heart multiple swallow plus washing down the residue bar liquid, it cleared the follows uh, very uh, nicely. As you see here, yeah, then uh, swallow, yes, yeah, it flows very clear. Uh, we have also what's known as Mandelson maneuver. Here the patient, I ask the patient to swallow, but don't let your items ever drop. Hold it up for several seconds. It's actually a difficult maneuver to, to, to teach to the patient, but it helps uh, 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 to increase the extent and duration of the laryngeal elevation. It increases the duration, but not the width of the US opening but also normalizes the timing of the pharyngeal swallow events, which means that it improves the overall coordination of the swallow. So it's best used to reduce the range of laryngeal elevation and the uh, cricopharyngeal uh, dysfunction. So um, uh, uh, the last behavior readjustment therapy is the modification of the food value. It should not be the first one because some centers recommend to change the food consistency from the start. It is not the first step. It's, the aim of that is to adapt the diet type and the form to fit the patient's swallowing needs and should be the last compensatory strategy examined if other problem, uh, strategies are not feasible. If we are uh, su uh, don't succeed in ND, uh, postural techniques or swallowing maneuvers or sensor enhancement techniques, we can use this modification of the food variables. So it is indicated with the patients with movement problems, patients who cannot follow directions, for patients in whom the oral sensor procedures are inappropriate. So we found that the thin liquid consistency is best used for reduced uh, tongue problem, any tongue problem, like the reduced range of tongue motion, tongue coordination, or tongue strength, or posterior movement. Also, the thin liquid consistency is best used for reduced pharyngeal wall contraction, reduced laryngeal movement, or cricopharyngeal dysfunction, while thick liquid consistency is best used for patients with delayed pharyngeal swallow and a reduced airway course. But it should be the last compensatory strategy if other procedures are failed. So what are the sequencing of intervention for that? What, what, what is the starting point? We start by the postural techniques first. If it is not working well, we can use techniques to increase the oral sensation. Then we can use swallowing maneuvers and we can use combinations of the previous techniques. And lastly, if needed, we can use diet modification. It, it shouldn't be the first one. I shouldn't recommend it. The, for example, semi-solids 
for stroke patients to start with that. No, we can use the first the techniques and then if it doesn't work, we can use combinations of multiple techniques and then lastly, the diet modifications. So uh, uh, the last few uh, slides, uh, this is if uh, the patients have uh, uh, oral cancer, for example, with significant loss of oral tissue or sexual resection of the part of all of the soft palate, or neurogenic patients with bilateral hypoglossoparesis or bilateral paresis, we can use some of these processes like bilateral lift processes to help with the velophalangeal closure, or we can use bilateral obturators to cover or fill a bilateral defect or bilateral augmentation or reshaping processes, which recontours the heart palate to interact with the remaining tongue more efficiently. And But the process should be introduced within the first four to six weeks post-operatively to prevent the development of poor habits of swallowing. And uh, lastly, surgical intervention, for example, dilatation of the pharynx or the upper swell sphincter as in the post-corrosive structures, pericopharyngeal myotomy can be used uh, or dilatation to help easing the tight upper swell sphincter, vocal cord augmentation or medialization in case of unilateral vocal cord paralysis, laryngeal suspension procedures or laryngeal fixation, and this may help in opening the upper swell sphincter, and lastly, if we didn't make this is theoretical surgical closure of the larynx, uh, laryngotracheal diversion, laryngotracheal separation, but I didn't see any of this, but it's present in the literature, but this is uh, for intractable aspiration. But if we don't have anything, case of failure of broad, we can, uh, to control aspiration, we can use nasogastric tube feeding for a short period of time, or gastric tube feeding for a longer period of time, and less applicable if you use intravenous line. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Haldun. And this is the end of my uh, presentation. I think uh, one hour and 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Abu Al Saad. It was an excellent presentation. I think this was one of the most interesting webinars that we have performed in Professional Voice Society and far more the best uh, webinar that I have listened about dysphagia. Thank you very much. Yeah, most you, welcome. You, you, you talked more than one hour without even a stop. So uh, I will talk a few minutes just to make you rest <laughs> and, and just okay. work on the questions that we have from the audience. Uh, sure. It was like an excellent crash course in just one hour about dysphagia. And it was it was really excellent from all aspects, uh, and we we didn't even lose one attendee from the audience. They they were they are all still in the room, uh, even yeah. even uh, even after yeah. for one hour. And okay. dear Tamer, we have some questions from the audience. That let's begin with them. Yes, and please. first one is. Uh, and the question is from uh, Puran. Puran uh, is a, a, a very nice lady that I know personally. She's an SLP and she's working in Baku, Azerbaijan. And, and I must mention that we have lots of international attendees from all over the world. And she's asking that, what is the difference between delayed upper esophageal sphincter response and cricopharyngeal dysfunction? Okay, great question. Delayed pharyngeal response means that the bolus past the ramus of the mandible without triggering the uh, pharyngeal swallowing reflex. You know that the swallowing reflex is triggered uh, when the bolus touch the anterior to celebrate because the receptors are there in the anterior uh, uh, fossil pillars. Uh, but uh, pharyngeal dysfunction, it is in the upper part of the esophagus. The upper part of the is not opening, it's dysfunctioning. It should open during the, uh, the swallowing. But if it's not open, we call it cricopharyngeal dysfunction. And this is characteristic of the uh, brain stem stroke, the cricopharyngeal dysfunction, while delayed pharyngeal response is characteristic of many things like stroke patients have a delayed pharyngeal response. So this is the difference between the delayed pharyngeal response, which means that swallowing is not triggered at the time it should be, while cricopharyngeal dysfunction, it is an opening of the upper esophageal sphincter. Thank you very much. Just one question from my, my side. While I was listening to your uh, webinar, uh, while I was listening to your speech, uh, I had a question in my mind when you when you talked about scre screening, but you were mentioning screening about like a like a bedside evaluation. What I want to ask is, 
you know, as phoniatricians or ENT doctors or audiologists, uh, we know uh, how it added to our clinical expertise when we began about uh, hearing screening in the newborn. You know, in, in many countries, we have newborn hearing screening and we have the chance to diagnose hearing difficulties, hearing problems very early. Including Egypt, uh, actually, yeah, we have this. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you recommend or do you have such a screening protocol for a specific disease, for example, for Parkinson's disease patients when they get the diagnosis or for some people that are at the intensive care unit that they need to be screened? Do you have such a protocol uh, that you know uh, in anywhere uh, internationally? Uh, let's talk about the, the dysphagia because the dysphagia, we have a validated evidence-based screening protocol for dysphagia in adults. It could be a problem in units actually, uh, but in adults we have this validated uh, uh, screening. Yeah, of course, I'm talking about adults, but uh, in any specific group, I mean, in just Parkinson patients, in just uh, intensive care units or something okay. like that. No, this is the screening. Uh, actually, uh, the, the, the aim of the screening, the dysphagia screening, is to if the patient is safe for oral feeding or not. Sure. It could be applied for any patient, whether it is Parkinson's disease or uh, uh, stroke patients or head and neck cancer patients. So we are using this validated screening protocol. So it, it's a pass and fail screening. It, have, it is more specific but less sensitive. So if the patient passed this screening, we can recommend the oral diet immediately. So it doesn't need to refer to do an instrumental. Assessment. But the patient, if they fail the screening, we recommend them to do the instrumental assessment. So it can be applied for any disease category, okay, for adult patients be validated. And we use it in, there are many screening tests, but we use it in Mansoura, the Yale score, it's screening is, uh, uh, the early screening uh, protocol, which is a very uh, good screening. It can be used in the intensive care unit. It can be used in the world. It could be used in the outpatient clinic, so we can use it that. Thank you. Another question is uh, from Arzubetil Duran. Arzubetil is an uh, associate professor in Turkey, in Ankara, in my city. And she is a laryngologist and she is a head and neck surgeon. And her question is, of course, she, she is thanking you a lot, like, like most of the attendees uh, that are sending messages here. And she asks you about what do you think about training supraglottic swallowing maneuver before partial laryngectomy uh, to be able to enhance postoperative swallowing? I mean, then <laughs> we, we, we train them just before making the laryngectomy so that they will be able to make it easier. Uh... You know, that is not uh, the case, actually, the case. It's uh, because you are, uh, if you train something, but it is, it will be uh, removed. So uh, after the uh, removal of the something of the larynx, and then we will see, because every part we leave during your surgery, surgery it can help the patient. So we cannot uh, um, predict if this will can help them or not. But my recommendation actually for the radiotherapeutic patients, we can do that before the radiotherapy. This will help the patient because and you know that the radiotherapy uh, is a long standing problem and the effect is, is later or not immediate. So the best is to train the patient two months before the radiotherapy and it may last six months after the radiotherapy. But for the uh, surgical uh, thing, no, I think we should wait after the surgeon. Then we sh we know what is the available for the patient. If it if he, we send we train, then we can train them. If it succeeded, we can, for example, we can train the postural techniques or do something of the sopraglottic or sober sopraglottic swallow. Uh, and if not succeeded, uh, we can go to another modality of feeding. So it's, we should wait after that because uh, I may try something which will not work later after the surgery. Thank you. Another question is from Emel Fuat. And uh, Emel is asking uh, why modification of food is the last strategy? Yeah, imagine that you are changing your time, the, the diet, you are, uh, uh, you are uh, accustomed to drink uh, uh, 
the tea and the, uh, to, to drink water. And we can manage that by the posture, simply by posture techniques. Why I change your diet type and I can manage that by another modality, which is more, uh, uh, can help you to prevent aspiration. So the last uh, uh, strategy is to, to, to change the type that because this is the quality of life of the patients. Uh, you are considering the quality of life of the patients. It should be the last one, not the first one. Uh, you had explained that we have two main gold standards, as we know. One of them is the radiological examination, and the other one is the endoscopic evaluation. And yes. you have also mentioned that, uh, of course, while making endoscopy, while making the flexible endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, we better we, we better visualize the residue, of course. But yep. uh, what is the modality if you had just one of them on on your uh, on your hands? Because uh, sometimes uh, some of our colleagues are working on private practice. They have the yeah. endoscopic evaluation equipment with them uh, for diagnosis, and they can easily also uh, use it for uh, diagnosis of uh, problem diagnosis of the uh, problems with uh, swallowing. But of course, if they are in a hospital setting, if they have a radiology department, they already have the equipment, but they sometimes do not have the stuff uh, or people with experience to make that tests. Yeah. So if you had a chance to choose one of them. Uh, how would you proceed? Let's let's say this is a very good question. Actually, uh, in my university, we have two modalities. Actually, we have the BD fluoroscopy and we have the PS. And actually, when I came after I I trained in the United States uh, with the Joanne Robbins, I was trained on the uh, BD fluoroscopy, and I uh, trained my staff on the BD fluoroscopy. And then we get the uh, PS, and then we train our staff on the PS. Actually, in my uh, in my private clinic, I'm using the PS. Uh, but in the hospital, I can use both. Uh, actually, we start by fees. And then if I'm interested to see something with, I can, with especially during the swallowing, as you know, the fees is not good during the swallowing. It, we can uh, predict after the swallowing happened that something is, but sometimes we miss something. So I'm using the uh, BD fluoroscopy for that purposes. So it depends on what is available. Uh, 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 with you, if in a, in a private uh, part, it's difficult that you have uh, to transfer your patient to, uh, to your colleague in radiology. I did that in my first years that I used to take my laptop and then I get my stuff and go to the one of my colleagues in radiology and then I wait in the waiting room. Actually, it's very difficult for me. Uh, in the hospital, we have a schedule. We have a specific time slot that for us that we can. Uh, uh, schedule for that, but uh, uh, for me, I'm using now uh, many, many of the uh, uh, fees, which is easy because I'm, I'm, I am controlling it by myself. But the BD fluoroscopy is uh, I have another department that share with me, or I have to allocate this. So it depends on what is available. Sometimes the, the fees is my gold standard I'm using, but I'm using the uh, modified barium solid if I'm interested to see something. Uh, is not seen because the click pharyngeal dysfunction cannot, uh, uh, yeah, the upper part of the circle is difficult to be seen and the uh, fees and the oral part is not uh, also difficult to be seen by the fees. So uh, the oral phase and the, and the upper part of the storage phase is for the uh, modified barium swallow. And also if I'm interested to something, to see something during the swallow, so I was also modified barium swallow. A great answer. Thank you. And you have already also mentioned the other modalities in your slides, uh, but of course we had a very limited time. Let me ask because there are also questions about this. And in okay. your clinical practice with adults uh, with dysphagia, when do you need clinically manometry and when do you need EMG? I mean, I can, I can diagnose and follow without them most of the patients, but what are the strict conditions that you need uh, an EMG or manometry? Yeah, manometry is actually if I am suspecting pressure changes in the upper part of the esophagus, like the cricopharyngeal dysfunction, uh, I, I can use, I, I can refer it to the gastroenterology colleague to make a manometry measurement. Actually, rarely use that, actually. Yeah, maybe uh, two to three or four times that I use, I refer to, to do manometry. 
So I'm doing that for the uh, Greek pharyngeal dysfunction or structure of the upper part of the esophagus, something like that. Uh, uh, and also for uh, EMG, just for diagnosis, uh, you know that there is uh, something now in the market about the, the about the stimulation of the uh, uh, muscles of the uh, uh, of the larynx to to be elevated by the this electro EMG. But uh, there is a debate on that in the literature. Some people say it elevates the upper uh, the hyolaryngeal complex, but some uh, say that it depresses the hyolaryngeal uh, complex. So it's a, there is a debate and there's still a lot of uh, uh, research in that. I didn't use it. I just used the uh, uh, muscles uh, uh, in, uh, uh, involved in the swallowing to exercise for that or swallow maneuvers. So I, I'm just EMG that I, uh, may be used for just for diagnosis, not for management. Okay, thank you. And I know that you are tired. You are talking like one and a half hour now. <laughs> but we have a few more questions. No problem. I tired. Yes. <laughs> the, one, one of them is, uh, with which consistency do you begin your examination? With fluoroscopy or endoscopic evaluation? Yes. Um, actually, I'm starting, um, uh, I'm starting by the... Uh, the screening first, the screen tell me what is if the screening fails, for example, I give the patient the water, so um, it's likely to be aspirated in that. But I'm following the protocol, I'm starting by the small amounts of liquid, no problem in that. If it is if the patient is aspirated on that, I may use the uh, the semi solids, small amount fit. If the patient is still aspirated on that, I'm, I'm immediately starting the uh, the uh, the therapy techniques, for example, posture techniques, ask them to, to do chin down, and then uh, show the effect of that. If it protecting the airway for both uh, consistency, that's okay. If not, I I'm, I'm editing that to to change the swallow physiology by asking the patient to do supraglottic swallow with chin down, holding the press before the swallow. If it okay, uh, uh, if not, I may recommend the NPO until the patient is. But at that time, if I recommend it in EPO, I ask the patient to take ice chips. Uh, ice chips is safe because it's like his saliva. He is swallowing all the saliva. So the ice chips, like I am I am colding the saliva. So this will wake up the system of swallowing. So for stroke patients, I may recommend the ice chips three times, teaspoonful, three times per day. And this actually very helpful after two days the patient can start swallowing after that. Thank you. And another question is from Maria Tadarus, and she is asking, what is the best management technique for head and neck post-irradiated patients who suffer from fibrosis? Yeah, we have, uh, actually there is no past technique, but there is many techniques that help the patients that have problems in the, uh, that area we can ask the patient to do shakir exercises as i said which is a head lifting exercises that will strengthen the sobra and the parietal muscles that will um, uh, increase the the width of the upper superior sphincter also the uh, head forwards also can be helpful the patients with uh, uh, upper part of the sophocles but sometimes the process is permanent and sometimes you need uh, to dilate it by the uh, osophageal dilators to ease the tightness of the upper part of the socus. But the best policy is to do these exercises before starting the radiotherapy, two months before the radiotherapy and to up to six months after the radiotherapy. This will reduce the muscle atrophy and reduce the fibrosis according to literature and according to my clinical expertise in that. Actually, I have a lecture on the head and neck cancer patients, how to deal with it. I, I cannot say all of the things. I have some of the tips and uh, for uh, for these patients, how to deal with the head and neck cancer uh, patients, whether they are using uh, uh, after surgery or after radiotherapy. Okay. Uh, this is a message from the audience uh, and me. Uh, I think we need to reserve uh, more time of Professor Abu Asad to have 
more tips and tricks about dysphagia patients. So we will request uh, to uh, we will request him to be with us uh, at least once more about dysphagia. <laughs> sure, sure, my dear, sure, my dear. It's it, my it, pleasure. That was it, always it, my it, pleasure. It, 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 it's, it was a real pleasure listening to you. May come to uh, Antalya and say something like that. So yeah, come to yes, Antalya. Uh, <laughs> actually, I didn't put a slide not to interrupt yours, but. Of course, we are expecting the whole audience that listens to us to the UEP Congress in Antalya. Uh, the website is uep2023.org, and Professor Tamer Abu Asad is one of the organizers, one of the board members, and the, one of the uh, faculty members that will be talking about anything about phoniatrics, but of course, especially about dysphagia as well. <laughs> so uh, it was our pleasure to be with you. Uh, uh, dearest Tamer, I will take one uh, last question. We have a question from Shaima Sherif here. And actually, she is asking about uh, what's the management for patients with oropharyngeal dysphagia who have inability to protect the airways from secretions? Uh, I mean, that the secretions that we see uh, in the preformed sinuses or vallecula, as I can understand, yeah. that have the possibility to invade the airway. And let me yeah. add, and add, add just another small question because uh, it's usually on the minds of our residents, uh, the ANT residents and phoniatrics residents. Is there a specific way to uh, diagnose, differentiate uh, a psychogenic dysphagia? Uh, we don't usually see the secretions. We, we yes. don't. Uh, yes. We don't sometimes have the possibility to make an endoscopic evaluation. Uh, we feel that it may be psychogenic, but but as we are uh, all medical doctors, because of the uh, because of our uh, ethical yeah. uh, standards, we cannot just yep. say to something psychogenic without uh, without uh, being able to uh, know that it's not it's fully not yes. organic. Uh, do you have a, a trick for that? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I have a trick for that. Um, uh, first, for the answer of the secretions of that, the best policy is to use eye shapes. Eye shapes is the, is the one of the policies that you can use it to uh, manage the secretions that are accumulating in the biform sinus and the vallecula. So eye shapes is a good uh, um, uh, um, protocol that can uh, manage the secretions of the patients in the vallecula and the biform sinuses until the uh, the swallowing system is wake up and when the peristalsis come again, this will help the patient to swallow. For the psychogenic dysphagia, actually I have a slide for that, but I didn't mention it because of the time. The psychogenic patient try to uh, reluctant to initiate the swallow. They are uh, uh, playing with the food polis in the oral cavity. Maybe backwards and forwards and backwards and forward, and they didn't initiate the swallow. But once the swallow is initiated, it moves nicely. One second the oral and one second the pharyngeal case with no penetration and aspiration. So uh, they may be reluctant. The patient could be reluctant in initiating the swallow. This is the only thing. But once the swallow is initiated, nothing. There is no aspiration, no penetration, nothing at all. So this is the, we can ignore that. And of course, there's the history about uh, uh, psychogenic trauma or something uh, uh, behind that. Dear friends, dear attendees, dear participants, uh, one of the most things that I enjoy uh, in our courses, congresses about phoniatrics is uh, to spend time with Professor Abu Asad, my dear friend Tamer. Uh, so uh, I enjoyed being with him here, both, both personally, uh, and of course, uh, as, as, a, as a listener like you. And I hope you enjoyed the time that you spent with us, uh, like I enjoyed being with Professor Abu Asad. Tamar, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure for me uh, to have you here with us, although not personally, that we hug each other so closely, like brothers as always. Uh, yes. I couldn't touch you, but I felt uh, your warmness from the screen. Uh, and, and I'm sure we will have the chance to meet each other before Antalya. Uh, I will be looking forward to it. And I am leaving the last words to you. Uh, thankfully, uh, thank you very much for being with us. I th thank you. Thank you, my dear friend, Haldun. It's, it's my pleasure and I was honored and I, 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 I enjoyed actually lecturing uh, for that uh, course. I know there's a lot of information. I actually, I have the double of these slides in my, uh, in my uh, laptop and actually I, I spent a lot of time to shorten and summarize 
the information because there is a lot, a lot of information in that. But uh, uh, I enjoyed that. Uh, and uh, as uh, you mentioned, it's my pleasure to be with you another uh, webinars or two or three more as you wish, because this is my pleasure. And thank you very much, my dear, for this invitation. And I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and good good evening. And we also thank to the whole family, your big family, because you left your time with your family for being with us. Please say hi and, and convey our respects to them. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good evening, dear friends. We are hoping to meet in another Thursday webinar by Professional Voice Society or in, a, in another uh, online or face-to-face -face, in-person meeting with the uh, Union of European Phoniatricians. Have a nice evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.